These foolish things remind me of you. Gad Beck, a German, Jewish, and gay resistance fighter, would work tirelessly to fight against the oppression of the Holocaust during World War II. He would also fight the stigma against homosexuality after the war. Not only was Beck Jewish, but he was openly homosexual in Nazi Berlin. Gad Beck was born on the 13th of June, 1923, after his twin sister Margot Beck. The Becks initially began their life in Berlin within a booming cultural era, yet to see the rise of Nazism. Gad Beck would turn 10 in 1933 when Hitler came to power. Since his father, Heinrich Beck, was Jewish while his mother, Hedwig Beck, was Christian, Margot and Gad Beck would be classified by the Nazis as mixed race, or Mischlings. Beck lived under constant threat of persecution from social acceptability, social constructs, and the Nazi regime. He never let this stop him from aiding the people he cared for and loved. Beck would find himself a leader against Nazism as he worked to save the lives of Jewish people. As a direct oppositionist to the Nazi regime, he defied unjust laws, subverted high-ranking officers, and boldly organized resistance movements. While not an ambassador of his people, he was clearly a diplomat of interpersonal relations, employing his activism beyond the war to advocate against remaining anti-Semitism and homophobia. These had been deep-seated prejudices within Germany well before Gad Beck's time. However, at the turn of the 20th century, social and legislative efforts were made to reverse this long-standing stigma. Subcultures of gay communities prospered. The Weimar Republic weakened its enforcement of the anti-homosexual document, paragraph 175, and Berlin became populated with a variety of gay, lesbian, and transgender bars. I mean, yes, there was a lot of cultural grim, as you say, but there was an awful lot of poverty, an awful lot of intolerance. But I think their attitude was, well, what shall we do tomorrow? Who knows what's going to happen? So let's at least enjoy ourselves tonight. You know? Regretfully, this progression would be halted as the Nazi party enforced their idea of the German race. Gad Beck, born during this cultural boom, would have to endure his formative years under this oppression. In der wirklich der morgige Tag das Ende hätte bringen können war die Lust auf Sexualität wesentlich stärker. Despite Germany's change in attitude towards homosexuality, among other minorities, Beck would be able to find solace within his own family. Jewish youth associations formed at the beginning of the 20th century. However, during the rise of the Nazi party, only several illegal Zionist organizations remained. Beck, now 16, took up various occupations in these groups. During this time, Beck worked at a cardboard factory. This is where he would meet Zizek Schwarzens, a Zionist youth leader and a prominent teacher to Gad Beck. From Schwarzens, he learned political education, Jewish culture, and various tactical strategies that aided him in future diplomatic relations. Not only would Beck become closer to his religious identity through these actions, but he would meet his first great love, Manfred Levine. Beck truly noticed Levine after the two played the lead roles in Don Carlos within their youth group. In the summer of 1942, the two boys worked together as air raid patrolmen. They would often sleep together in the basements of the buildings they patrolled. One night, Beck received a small, handmade journal from Levine, describing their love and time spent together. Manfred's small booklet was a gesture of his affection, prefacing it with, Dear, kind Gad, I owe you a present. No, I want to give you one. Not just so that you can get something from me that you can glance through and then lay aside forever, but something that will make you happy whenever you pick it up. Beck would treasure the journal all of his life. Yeah, and then was aber eines Tages so weit. Ich kam am Abend in, in das Haus, ich wollte übernachten dort. Und da war sein Bruder. Wo ist Manfred? Na, no, unsere ganze Familie haben sie heute abgeholt. Und ich gehe wirklich zu dem Chef von Manfred. Na, no, hast du den Mut? Sagt er, so richtig deutscher Berber. Ja, ich hab Mut. Hör mal, sagt er, mein Sohn ist doch so groß wie du. Der hat eine Hitlerjugenduniform. Jetzt drin holst du mir raus, den Manfred. Ich ging zu große Hamburger, ging da rein, Herr Littler, und der sagt mir ganz ruhig, diese Gestapo-Fritze dort, na, sie bringen mir doch den zurück. Ich sage, was soll ich denn mit den Juden? Und geh mit ihm raus, aus meiner Schule, 20, 30 Meter etwa. Ich weiß genau, welche Stelle es ist. Dorthin. Und er bleibt stehen und sagt ganz ruhig, aber also ohne jede Erregung, Ich kann mit dir nicht kommen, Gott. Wenn ich jetzt meine Familie verlasse, die kranke Familie, bin ich in meinem Leben nie frei mehr. Ich habe mit ihnen zu gehen. Ich bin der Einzige, Starke und Kräftige. 
sagt nicht auf Wiedersehen, dreht sich um und geht zurück in meine Schule. Beck would never see his lover again. Manfred Levine presumably died with his family in Auschwitz, his memory only carried on by Beck. The loss hovered over Beck for years and represents a moment where he truly matured. After the loss of Levine, Beck refused to lose anyone else he was close with. Beck tried to talk others into making the move underground, but many continued to go to the transports. For short periods, he would hide his Jewish friends in his attic. As a distraction, Beck mainly busied himself with youth group affairs. In the spring of 1943, Gad Beck joined the Chug Chaluzzi, an illegal Jewish youth group located within Berlin. The Chug Chaluzzi was founded by Zizek Swarsons, who recruited many former members of his Zionist youth group. The resistance group continued to pass down religious and Zionist youth culture to its younger members. Often, they would sneak out to the woods or theater, conduct Hebrew language lessons, and celebrate Jewish holidays. Their main objective was to allow its members to continue to live as Jews and to find escape routes outside of Germany. Schwarzens would escape to Switzerland in February 1944, where he would meet his contacts in the Swiss embassy. These contacts would help send money to the doorstep of the Chug Chaluzzi's new leader, Gad Beck. Schwarzens believed Beck would be the most appropriate member to take his place. This was when Beck would meet Zwei Abrahamson. Abrahamson had escaped to the factory operation, yet his family had been taken. To remain in hiding, he joined the Chug Chaluzzi and often worked with Beck. Abrahamson described the work Gad Beck did through the Chug Chaluzzi. Gad was very, very active at that time. He was always on the road, arranging things, getting to know people. He had a special talent, an ability to make a connection with people and especially with friendly people. He knew with whom you could be friendly, with whom you had to be careful, with whom you can connect, with whom you can talk to about certain topics. He was more like the foreign minister of our group, in charge of the big things, like hiding places, papers, getting money, moving money, making connections. Through Beck's work, he was able to organize the group efficiently and provide stability to their situation, even if it was momentarily. The members helped one another obtain food stamps, fake ID cards, in hiding places. They continued their youth group activities as before, despite the growing presence of the Gestapo in search of information about illegal Jews. The resistance of this group was less about direct opposition and more about surviving. While underground, the group still practiced religious content and was the only resistance group still within Germany to act under such religious motives. In 1945, escape for those who remained in the Chug Chaluzzi was becoming more impossible by the day. Despite the group's efforts to remain in hiding until the end of the war, more of the members were beginning to be discovered and taken away to camps. On March 3, 1945, Beck and Abrahamson would be captured by a Jewish snatcher, as well as two SS officers. Miraculously, during Beck's interrogation with Eric Muller, he left unscathed. While he was still being imprisoned, most of Beck's time would be spent in his cell. In the final weeks of the war, the assembly camp was ordered to liquidate. Moved to the basement cell, Beck reunited with Abrahamson in the midst of the final bombings. Days later, they would be released. For the first two years after 1945, Beck would arrange immigration documents for people to go to Palestine, later Israel. Beck himself immigrated to Israel in 1947, where he dedicated his life to helping other victims and survivors of the Holocaust. Beck continued to share his story with others, as to combat both intolerance and hate. Ich komme nach Hause, Mutti! Ich habe mein erstes Mal gehabt. Ich war erschrocken. Nicht die Größe seines Geschlechtes, die war auch ganz schön. Wir waren mit einer deutschen U-Bahn. Dann muss man aber nach ihm leben. Dann bist du Jüde, Mädchen. Und so heiratet man he contributed with seminars to help them understand both the answers and the non-answers, as a contemporary, a living witness, who has the ability to bring home history that often seems incomprehensible. His goal has always been to remember, and, most importantly, to share his experience. Gad Beck's sheer audacity makes him one of the most illustrious figures during the Holocaust. He never let the constant threat of persecution jeopardize his courage and sense of confidence. His story deconstructs the roles of a typical hero figure while still establishing him as a diplomat. What separates Beck from other notable liberators is that Beck had no power within Nazi Germany. He worked beneath the regime, risking his life for the sake of others. He faded from public awareness because he didn't fit into the mold of a generic historic resistor. Gad Beck's story may not be as grandiose as other harrowing Holocaust stories, but it doesn't have to be. The very fact that he, both a Jewish and openly homosexual man, survived this era of German history is a miracle. He was responsible for the safety and lives of roughly 50 Jewish Holocaust survivors. A remarkable feat for any young adult. These foolish things remind